I'm happy to help. Work hard, study hard. Let's get to our questions. Question 81. The subject is placed inside a room with a variety of toys and activities during a functional analysis. The subject is allowed access to all toys and activities for 10 minutes. The subject is then taken out of the room and the next condition is prepared. What condition does this scenario most likely represent? Okay, let's break it down. We're conducting a functional analysis. We've got several different conditions that we can conduct during our analysis. And what are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to accomplish the goal of figuring out what is the function of our behavior, okay? We're manipulating antecedents, manipulating consequences to determine why is that behavior happening. So in this condition, we allow the subject free reign to all toys and activities. We don't give attention. We don't take anything away, no demands. They just have free reign. What condition does this represent? Is this a the control condition? Yes. In the control condition, we were just observing the client with no demands, full access to reinforcers, and nothing else. Okay, We were just observing and watching what they were doing. This is our control. The difference between the control and the alone is the alone is to test for self-stimulatory behavior. Okay, We're going to remove all these toys and things, and we're just going to put them in a room alone. That's the main difference between control and alone. Control is free access to reinforcers. Alone is just alone. Then, of course, you have contingent escape and contingent attention. Contingent escape, if you give a demand in the condition and the behavior happens, you allow escape. And atten contingent attention, if the client engages in attention-seeking behavior, you give attention, right? So in a functional analysis, you're essentially intentionally reinforcing the behavior with whatever reinforcer you think serves as the function. But in this case, we're just looking for what condition we're in. And we are in the control, control condition. The subject is allowed access to all toys and activities for 10 minutes. Our answer here is A. 82, you want to develop a task analysis for a 10-year-old who wants to learn a pre-shot routine for hitting a golf ball. Which of the following would be least appropriate to use in the development of the task analysis? Be careful. We're not talking about the task chain. We're talking about creating the task chain. The task analysis is what we use to create our task chain. Task analysis is breaking down that complex behavior into simple steps. If we want to create a task analysis or you want to develop a task chain, right, for a 10-year-old who wants to learn a pre-shot routine, what can you use? There are three things specifically that you're allowed to use. A, observe a pre-golfer's pre-shot routine, a pro-golfer's pre-shot routine and model your steps after him or her. Are you allowed to create a task chain or use a task analysis on somebody who is a professional or an expert? Absolutely. Okay, that is allowed. What about B, observe other 10-year-olds as they do their pre-shot routines. How good is another 10-year-old really going to be at giving you an idea of what the best way to do a skill is? Unless that 10-year-old is somehow a pro at 10 years old, which I doubt, they're not going to give you the best possible chain for your 10-year-old, okay? We should observe experts. We should observe, observe pros. We should observe ourselves, okay? Or we should observe the actual client doing it. But observing other individuals of equal skill, okay, or equal proficiency doesn't make much sense. So B, so far, is the least appropriate. C, generate a task analysis and then modify and refine it using trial and error. Yes, if you don't have access to any of these things, okay, you can generate one on your own and then implement it and refine it using trial and error with the actual learner themselves. And then D, consult a golfing coach on the appropriate way to perform a pre-shot routine. Yes, this is an expert, just like the pro golfer is a pro. We can consult an expert on the best way to conduct this task analysis and complete this task chain. The least appropriate will be watching another 10-year-old as they do their pre-shot routine. Okay, so B is going to be our answer. 83, Kendall is given a picture of a dog and matches it to a picture of a dog. He is then given a picture of a cat, which he matches to a picture of a cat. Finally, he is given a picture of a tiger and he matches it to a picture of a tiger. Kendall has demonstrated what? What skill are we working on? Let's attack the question. We're attacking, attacking, attacking. This is stimulus equivalence. We have reflexivity, symmetry, transitivity. D, reactivity is not part of stimulus equivalence. Let's eliminate it. 
it leaves us with reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. Go through each one. Reflexivity is what? Reflexivity is A equals A. Symmetry is A equals B, B equals A. Transitiv transitivity is A equals B equals C equals A. What is represented in this question? Well, if you give a picture of a dog A and match to a picture of a dog A, give a picture of a cat A matched to a picture of cat A, and then picture of a tiger matched to a picture of a tiger A equals A, we're demonstrating A equals A, we're demonstrating reflexivity. Don't be intimidated by stimulus equivalence. It's almost literally assigning letters to the stimuli in the question and writing it out. If you map it out and assign letters, you can't miss these questions. Transitivity, transitivity is the hardest, right? Because you have to find A, you have to find B, you have to find C, and you, it might take a while to get there. But if you carefully diagram or carefully label your stimuli with letters, you won't miss these questions. 84, Johnny's favorite breakfast is pancakes. Whenever Johnny is served pancakes, he drowns them in maple syrup. In response, Johnny's mom removes the maple syrup. What can be said about this intervention? Be very careful here. This is kind of a trick question. What's occurring? Well, Johnny is eating pancakes. Johnny has served the pancakes. He drowns them in maple syrup. And then Johnny's mom removes the maple syrup. So the consequence to the drowning in the maple syrup is removal, right? So this is some sort of negative consequence. However, what do we say about consequences? How do we determine if a consequence is reinforcement or punishment? We have to look at future behavior. Consequences don't affect current behavior. Consequences affect future behavior. In this case, do we know how Johnny reacts? Do we know if Johnny continues to drown the pancakes and maple syrup? What if Johnny knows his mom will, will remove the maple syrup in the future? So now when he gets the maple syrup, he pours even more on top of his pancakes. That would be considered what? This would now be negative reinforcement because removing the maple syrup actually increased the behavior. We just don't know. So what can we say about this intervention? Can we say it's positive punishment? Well, it's definitely not positive punishment because it's not a positive inter intervention. Something is being taken away, not added. And then we have negative punishment and negative reinforcement. Yes, it is negative. Do we know if it's punishment or reinforcement? No, for the reasons we just listed. Until we know how Johnny reacts and how his future behavior is changed, we can't for sure say punishment or reinforcement. So we have to go with D. It is unclear, not enough information. Kind of a tricky question, right? But if you get a question like this on the exam and D is an option, that's the best answer. Now, let's say D wasn't the option and you have positive punishment, negative punishment, negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement. Well, then you have to change how you're thinking about the question, okay? <clears throat> but ideally, on the exam, they're either going to tell you what happened in the future or they're going to give you additional information. If they don't, you can't definitively say it's punishment or reinforcement. 85, Brock likes to eat at Subway. After he has finished with the sandwich, he will throw the wrapper away. Sometimes he places it in the trash can, sometimes he throws it in the trash can, and sometimes he shoots it like a basketball into the trash can. This behavior set is an example of a what? What is happening? Brock is throwing the wrapper away. That's what he's accomplishing. How does he get there? He places it, he throws it, and sometimes he shoots it, right? So if we were thinking about generalization, we would have, okay, one stimuli, right? The wrapper. And to get it in the trash can, he can place it, he can throw it, or he can shoot it. Response generalization, multiple responses for one stimuli. But if we look at our answer choices, response generalization is not a choice. So we have to go back and think again. This is how we attack the question. We predict, is it an answer choice? No, let's try again. Can we eliminate stimulus generalization? Absolutely. We're only worried about the single stimuli. We're only worried about the trash getting into the trash can. We're really worried about these multiple responses. So stimulus generalization is out. Stimulus class is out. Okay, again, one single stimulus. We're not worried about multiple stimuli. So we're really worried about response and response class. Well, now it's pretty easy, right? Because a response is a single instance of behavior. This question, we're worried about three different types of responses, three different types of behavior. 
Okay. And if we have multiple responses that all serve the same function, we consider that what? We consider that a response class. These three different responses all serve the same function, right? Of getting this trash into the trash can. So this behavior set is an example of a response class. 86, which of the following answer choices best describes self-management? Okay, so this one's kind of um, pedantic, but I put questions like this on the exam just to make you aware of the specifics, okay? Because sometimes they will get very technical on you, okay? Um, on the definition questions, that is. So if you're going to describe to me self-management, okay, and I wanted the most accurate, precise definition possible, how would you describe self-management? Would you tell me it's strategies to produce a positive change or a negative change? No, okay. What about produce a change versus produce a desired change? Well, let's see. Let's think about it. Are we trying to produce a change with self-management or are we trying to produce a desired change? That's why positive and negative aren't necessarily right because we're not self-management. You know, ideally, and most of the time we'll use self-management for a positive change, but who knows, might, we might use it for negative change for whatever reason, but we can't definitively say it's a positive or negative change. And while it is a change, right? Self-management is producing a change. More specifically, it's producing a desired change. Now, will you have to know that specifically? Maybe, maybe not. You will need to know the aspects of self-management. But the, the important thing when you're studying, okay, is to just prepare as much as possible, right? Like if you the old analogy of having as many guns or as many bullets in the gun as possible, right? The more prepared you are, okay, the better off you're going to be. Again, this is very specific, very technical, but at least now you're familiar with it. So self-management technically is producing a desired change, not just producing a change. 87, session notes. The client engaged in self-injurious behavior. The client swung an open hand towards his leg, repeatedly contacting the palm of his hand. A red mark was observed as a result of the behavior. What is the session note describing? It's clearly describing a behavior, right? Are we looking at the function? Are we looking at topography? Are we looking at magnitude? What are we looking at here? Well, they're describing to us how the behavior looks. It's self-injurious, but we don't know why it's occurring. We don't have any function, so we can eliminate that best bet is it's going to be topography, okay? Maybe magnitude, right? A red mark was observed as a result of the behavior, but most likely ought to be topography because we're describing how the behavior looks. So that's our prediction. So A, the function of the behavior. Did we have a function in the question? No, the client engaged in self-injurious behavior. The client swung an open hand towards his leg repeatedly, contacting the palm of his hand. A red mark was observed as a result of the behavior. No antecedent, no consequence, no function. So A is out, and then, of course, D is out. That leaves us with B and C. Well, C says both function and topography. Since we're not describing the function, we can eliminate C. That leaves us just with B. We are describing how the behavior looks or the topography of the behavior. We didn't even have to worry about magnitude, and that was a stretch anyway, okay? But had it been included, then we have to think a little deeper. Topography is still the better answer, though. So what is a session note describing? B, the topography or how the behavior looks. You always take the interstate to work in the morning. Today, you decided that you wanted to grab coffee on the way to work, so you took an alternate, alternate route towards the coffee shop. There ended up being heavy traffic on the alternate route, and you were 20 minutes late to work. You never took the alternate route to work again. What best describes what occurred in this scenario? What's the difference between this question and the question we did earlier? We know how the behavior changed. That's crucial. Since we know how the behavior changed and how it was affected in the future, we can now say, was it reinforcement or was it punishment? So let's go through it. What happened? You wanted to grab coffee. So you took a different way to the coffee shop. Okay. There ended up being heavy traffic and you were 20 minutes late to work. Okay. So was something added or was something taken away? Well, the consequence, right, really for taking the alternate route was heavy traffic, okay? As a result, right, you were 20 minutes late to work, okay? 
something was added. This is positive. We're adding the traffic, okay, or we're adding the being late, okay? That's the aspect we're adding, right? So this is positive. And then what happened to your behavior? Did it increase or did it decrease? Well, you never took that alternate route again, so it decreased. So we're looking at positive punishment. Go through positive and negative reinforcement punishment questions like that. Identify your behavior. Identify the future behavior. Identify was something added or taken away, okay? And then put them together. So what best describes what occurred in the scenario? Since there was traffic and you were 20 minutes late to work, you never took the alternate route to work again. Your behavior decreased. This was positive punishment. 89, you instructed your RBT to take whole interval data. Target behavior was your client sitting in the chair without standing up. The RBT recorded the following data. How many responses should they report? Does the target behavior matter in this question? No. All we're worried about is the data. We know it's whole interval data, and that's going to give us our answer. So we need to look at the data, consider whole interval, and then report how many responses we should have. If you look at the top, it says we're using 20-second intervals. So if we're taking whole inter interval data using 20-second intervals, how long does the behavior need to occur to count? 20 seconds, the whole interval. So one, 19 seconds. No. Two, eight. No. Nine. No. 19. No. 18. No. Four. 19. Four. No. 19. No. And 12. No. Do we count the behavior at all? Nope. We would record zero responses. This gives you a pretty clear picture of why sometimes interval data isn't that great. Did the behavior occur? Absolutely. Behavior occurred throughout observation, right? Throughout the entire time. What is data going to show? Data is going to show the behavior didn't occur at all. So we got to be careful with discontinuous measurement. However, if you're using whole interval data, the correct way to report the data would be zero responses. And then 90, Gloria has a massive amount of work for a project to do today. She knows she will need some help. So she picks up donuts for her coworkers. When she gets to work, she hands out the donuts and then says, okay, now I need your help with this project. Gloria just established a what? Immediately, you should think contingency or bribe. If we ever have some if then or then if statements, think contingency, think bribe. If we look at our answer choices, contingency and bribe are A and B. C, bootleg reinforcement is obtaining reinforcement without actually engaging in the response. You're, so think of a child who earns gummy bears for correctly answering a math problem. If it was bootleg reinforcement, the child might take a gummy bear and not have to answer the question. Okay. And then group contingency, right? Be careful. Is this a contingency or is it a bribe? What's a contingency? A contingency is an if then. If you help me with the project, then you get donuts. But how did Gloria do it? She said, okay, here are the donuts. Now help me with this project. She reversed it. it she went then if instead of if then. Again, Gloria should have said, if you help me with the project, then you get donuts. Instead, she says, here are your donuts. Now help me with the project. This is a bribe. A bribe is just the opposite of a contingency. We don't work with 